early hours of this icy London morning, and I remind myself of a quote from the poet Shelley, a line from Peter Bell III, written in 1819, that quote, Sometimes the devil is a gentleman. I recall the tales heard so often as a child, the many books written on the subject, perhaps the most notorious unknown killer in history, certainly one of the most thorough. He stalked women in the dark, only certain types of women. His calling card came in the shape of a mutilated corpse, his signature unmistakably cold. Surgical steel. I am once again reminded that a cunning psychopath armed with surgical knowledge and a razor-sharp scalpel can tear a human life apart in a very short time indeed. I seek the truth about just such a man. It began August 31, 1888, by the second week of November of that year, the hideous legend had become a global topic. Many questions were raised, the most enduring of which has haunted me all my life. Just who was Jack the Ripper? Was he a lone killer bent on revenge? Why did he strike only prostitutes? And why did the killings end with the fifth victim? On this walk through an isolated forest, I carry with me a book which has brought me halfway across the world. There have been many manuscripts theorizing on the Ripper case. But in the few days spent poring over this particular book, I became convinced that the author had at last presented the dark truth. As for the book I carry with me, it is called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. The author is to this point known only to me by a few frantic telephone calls made at the most preposterous times in the early morning. His name is Stephen Knight. He lives not far from where the murders took place. His trek toward the truth began in September 1973, when, as a journalist for the East London Advertiser, he interviewed a man who would light the spark. The Advertiser was the lone surviving newspaper covering the area of Whitechapel, Jack's favorite prowling ground. The subject of Stephen Knight's interview in 1973 was a man named Joseph Sickett, son of the renowned Victorian painter Walter Sickett. An interview with the son of an artist is not what one would usually call earth-shattering material. But when the specter of Jack the Ripper becomes synonymous with the man's story, suddenly a whole new light blazes from the void of unanswered questions. My name is Ray McGregor, a seeker in the unknown, if you like. My travels have taken me to the quiet stillness offered in this place to meet Stephen Knight and to unravel one of history's greatest and most macabre mysteries. This is a story which began in the English autumn of 1973 with that interview. Stephen Knight, the cover of the book is a little battered, but every well-read novel uh, is thus presented. I have poured over many a horror tale in my life and... Uh, gory mysteries, but the story of Jack the Ripper from those freezing days of the late 1880s has had many theories attached to it from criminologists to ordinary citizens and, of course, many other writers. But you presented a tale that I regard as the finest I have ever written. You embarked on a course that would take you through 18 months of mystery, intrigue, controversy, and a story that once read makes Watergate look like a, a Sunday school picnic, really, doesn't it? Mm, yes, it does, very much so. Um, I was researching for a year before I started to write, and then writing for six months while researching the latter part of the book. Mm. Let's go back to the East End of London in the late 1880s. These were certainly not good times for anybody. It was a very bleak, horrifying place, especially for prostitutes who were selling their souls for... What, a penny or something? How much were, were they likely to make if they were lucky? Penny or tuppence a client, I suppose, in those days. Um, the price of a bed was fourpence, and for slightly less, you could get a, a rope in a very, very seedy doss house, running alive with cockroaches. Uh, simply a rope strung along from, from a wall to another wall, and a dozen or so people would hang on it, you know, like that, and sleep. My word. For the whole night. And that was luxury compared with what most of these poor women had. You, they were sleeping out of doors on most nights and uh, under railway arches and anywhere they could mm. find some sort of shelter. 
Of course, let's now knock down one myth about our Jack. These women, A, were certainly not young, uh, and B, they were not in any shape or form pretty, the unfortunate victims. No, um, obviously, as you say, the, the average Hollywood representation is of a sort of music hall girl. These women were very much more degraded than that. Uh, they were in their 40s, most of them, and which meant in those days, with the sort of life they led, that they would have looked in their 60s at least. Mm. Uh, very haggard, very, very drunk, probably toothless, all of them, certainly. Some of them didn't have any teeth at all. Uh, they were really most unattractive-looking creatures. There were around 80,000 prostitutes working in London at that time. Mm. Yet, we are looking here, and we're going to look closely, at only five. Now, other writers have suggested, in fact, one writer suggested perhaps 20 victims. Other figures of six, seven, eight were attributed to the Ripper, but you say there are only five. Yes. Rip of victims. I'm not alone in saying that. Uh, Sir Melville McNaughton, who took over as assistant commissioner of, the Scotland, of Scotland Yard shortly after the Ripper murders ended, closed the, the Ripper file uh, with a report. And he stated in that file that the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. Anyone has, who has delved at all deeply into the case since then has agreed with him on the medical evidence uh, alone, it is certain that uh, Jack the Ripper had no more than five victims. One writer suggested that he had only four because one of the victims uh, that this writer said uh, had her throat cut in the opposite direction from the other uh, victims. Uh, but I established from a previously undiscovered post-mortem report that this victim too, Elizabeth Stride, had her throat cut in exactly the same way. So, yes, it, it's definite that there were five victims and five victims only. Whitechapel victim number one, Mary Ann Nichols. She was in her forties. She was very down at heel. Much the worse for drink most of the time because well, as with all the victims, that was the only solace they could find in life, gin, and the, um, the comfort that drunkenness brought. Uh, she wasn't too badly dressed because she'd not that much earlier been given uh, clothing by the Lambeth workhouse. She'd led a very poor life and a very distressing life. She'd had a very bad time with her husband and she'd had children and she'd come from the Lambeth area and, and come to the East End and settled into prostitution. On the night of August the 31st, she was with a friend called Emily Holland, whom she last saw in, she, she was with her in Whitechapel at about one o'clock in the morning. She said goodbye to her. She was going off to find a client. Uh, and she said, look what a pretty bonnet I've got, or some such words as that. And she walked off towards Whitechapel Station. A few hours later, she was discovered in a doorway in Bucks Row, on the pavement, ritually laid out. Stephen, the words ritually laid out they become more and more important as this story unfolds, correct? Right, yes. Let's look at the victims. We've just talked of Mary Nichols. Let's talk of her frightening injuries. It wasn't just a sweet killing. I mean, this woman was the first of five to be totally slaughtered. If we could look at a word, that would be it, wouldn't it? Yes, I mean, that's totally slaughtered in the sense that we're talking in the, in the context of the Ripper killing suggests she was at totally cut to pieces, which wasn't true. Uh, she was laid out and her intestines were sort of cut out and uh, there was general mutilation in the genital area. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. More detail than that we don't know because the 
newspapers didn't go into any more detail and the police and medical reports haven't survived. Uh, but it certainly was a very horrifying murder, but not nearly as horrifying as those which were to follow. At ten past six in the morning of September 8, 1888, Inspector Joseph Chandler on duty at the Commercial Street Police Station was informed there had been another Whitechapel murder. This time, once again, a prostitute in her mid-forties, Anne Siffy, otherwise known as Annie Chapman. She again was laid out. At her feet were laid out several trinkets. There were two rings, two brass rings, laid side by side, and two mint-condition brass farthings, laid edge to edge. And she was even more mutilated. Uh, far more appalling injuries than Mary Nichols. She, her entrails were completely taken out, cut out of her, and her intestines were thrown over her shoulder. Her throat was cut so deeply that her head was almost severed from her body. Two victims in the one evening. His first, the gangling Swedish prostitute, once again 45 years old. She was known as Long Liz, Elizabeth Stride. Long Liz Stride was found murdered in a backyard or a courtyard adjoining the uh, a, a socialist club in Stepney, south of Commercial Road. Catherine Eddowes was discovered, as I say, 45 minutes later in Mitre Square, Aldgate. The first victim, Stride, the only injuries she had was a cut throat, which, as I said, has led some people to say she wasn't a ripper victim at all. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. The second victim, Catherine Eddowes, was horribly cut about. Her, not only was her body cut about in the manner of Nichols and Chapman and her entrails thrown over the shoulder again but she was stabbed about the face cut very deliberately on the cheeks and her eyelids were slit and she also had her throat cut from left to right I want to talk about the final victim Marie Kelly yes she was butchered like an animal at the same time there, there was this element of ritual she was laid out on her own bed she is the only victim to have been discovered indoors uh, and she was laid out in a sort of ritualistic fashion with uh, one arm folded across her chest um, what there was left of her chest. Both her breasts had been cut off, uh, her heart had been torn out, her entrails had been pulled out and intestines were thrown all over the walls and hung on the picture rails. Uh, as I say, her breasts had been cut off and they were on a side bench by her bed with her, along with her liver. Uh, there was blood everywhere. This lady, a lot of things hinge on Marie Kelly, don't they? Everything really hinges on Marie Kelly or her conduct. Uh, an old nun who was interviewed in 1973, uh, she then lived at Providence Row Women's Refuge, which was only two or three minutes from where Mary Kelly had lived and died, remembered an elderly nun in 1915 saying... And, she, and this elderly nun had been around at the time the, the killings had taken place, saying to her, if it had not been for Mary Kelly, or Marie Kelly, none of the women would have been murdered. In other words, there would have been no Jack the Ripper. Uh, and as I say, so Mary Kelly's story, and what led up to the events of autumn, 
1888 are crucial to the whole affair. Jack the Ripper is a misnomer. And that is true because Jack the Ripper was not one man, but three. All working together for a specific purpose. Let's go one step past that and look at these five prostitutes and say that in an area the size of London out of 80,000, they were all from roughly one pretty small area and in fact they could have had more connections than being common victims. Absolutely. Once again, this is a, a point which has never been brought out before. Nobody has researched the case deeply enough to have discovered this central point. Out of all the prostitutes in London, 80,000, Jack the Ripper killed five. And all these people representing the killings as random maniac killings just do not consider that these women all knew each other. Two of them lived in the same house. They all, three, three of them lived in the same street and all of them rubbed shoulders daily in the same pub. Amazing. Which is 20 yards from where Mary Kelly was killed. Now, if we get back to what that nun said, if it had not been for Marie Kelly, none of these murders would have happened. Let us now look at why this lady becomes so important. Was she a witness to something? Did she know too much? To answer that, I have to take you from the East End back several years to the West End of London. Right. And back to Walter Sickert. The painter. The painter. Mm. The father of Joseph Sickert, my informant, and the original source of the story which I was investigating and which at every step I took became truer. We now find ourselves in 1884 in Cleveland Street in West London. Sickert's studio was in Cleveland Street and just opposite the studio was a sweet shop, confectionery shop in which there worked a girl called Annie Elizabeth Crook. Mm. She was a poor country girl and a Catholic. Sickert's antecedents were quite impressive. His father and his grandfather had been painters to the Royal Court of Denmark, and he knew both Princess Alexandra, who was Danish, and her husband, Edward the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, well, he wa was approached by Alexandra in the early 80s to take her son, Prince Eddie, under his wing because Eddie was becoming stifled at court. He was mixing only in the very narrow circles of, of the court. He, he was having no outside experience at all and, and she was very worried about his personal development and she wanted him to see the world of art, to, to just see a wider life uh, and more of his future subjects because had Eddie lived, he would have become king in 1910. Mm. And Sickert readily agreed. He was always ready to ingratiate himself with the powerful for obvious reasons. He, he didn't have all that much money and he wanted to get on himself. Uh, so... Prince Eddie, uh, who was Queen Victoria's grandson, of course, began to pay secret visits to Sickert in the guise of his younger brother, Albert, Albert Sickert. And so here we have them in those early years of that uh, decade, getting on together very well. Sickert goes out with uh, Prince Eddie to the pub, uh, and, and Eddie sees all sorts of things that he would otherwise not have done. All right, Stephen. Prince Albert Victor Christian Edward, future King of England, and the great artist Walter Sickert, the prince now with his newfound alias, able to enjoy the part-time life of a commoner. So what were they getting up to? Was it out 
dropping a few pints of ale, or were they a wenching, or what were the typical activities that Sickert and, uh, and Eddie were getting into? Well, both of those things, um, and Eddie took a few brief painting lessons from Sickert and met all Sickert's friends, who were a motley bunch, and was generally enjoying himself. Sickert knew this a girl who worked in the shop opposite, Annie Elizabeth Crook, as I said. Mm. And he was, Sickert was very fond of this girl, and he introduced the, the pair, Eddie and Annie. Eddie was struck by a certain similarity, this girl, to his mother. And he got on very well with her. And eventually, he fell in love with her and she with him. And they were secretly married. He couldn't officially marry her. Uh -huh. She was a Catholic for a start. Oh, yes. Um, he was under 25, so he would have had to get permission to marry her. He married her under a false name, but he married her, nevertheless, at a St. Saviour's private chapel near Cleveland Street. Then, in 1885, Annie bore... Eddie, a child, a daughter, who was born at Marylebone Workhouse and who was christened Alice Margaret Crook. She underwent two baptisms, an Anglican ba uh, baptism for Eddie and a Catholic baptism for Annie. But inevitably, it reached the ears of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. The throne was very unpopular at that time. There was constant fear of revolution, and S Salisbury himself was especially frightened of anarchists, socialists. There was a rising tide of socialism, and the government was very unpopular, the throne was very unpopular. He believed that it would take very little anyway to end the monarchy with Victoria's death. With Prince Eddie's behavior, he believed that if that became public, it would be almost a certainty that the monarchy would end, and, and end immediately, that there would be revolution, total revolution in England. Uh, so that information about Eddie marrying a Catholic, because anti-Catholic feeling then was incredibly intense, mm. if he had to keep that silence at all costs. So he staged a police raid in Cleveland Street while Eddie and Annie were together. Eddie was taken back to court and severely reprimanded, and Annie was taken away and confined in a hospital. And she spent the rest of her life in hospitals, workhouses, and prisons after some sort of primitive brain operation had been performed on her. Or some perverted to lobotomy. With something like that, to erase all memory of her past yeah. and her alliance with, with the prince. During that raid, the child escaped with her nanny. And that nanny, who had been taken on by Sickert, was Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly escaped from Cleveland Street, taking the child with her, and she escaped to the East End. Eventually, the, f the child found its way back, her way back, by a, a circuitous route to Sickert, and Sickert arranged for her upbringing in France with some friends there. Mary Kelly fell in with a group of prostitutes and eventually, completely down and out, they resorted to blackmail. She shared her dangerous knowledge with them and they blackmailed someone closely associated with the, the case. The fear was that these women who were walking around the East End knew of Eddie's conduct. Mm and were therefore in, in possession of information that could topple the throne. So like Annie Crook, they had to be silenced. And the Prime Minister put the operation into the hands of a man he trusted very greatly because that man had been very closely associated with silencing Annie Crook. Salisbury, I'm sure, never wanted anybody murdered. He put the case into the hands of this man, as I say, whom he trusted. Mm. This man decided the women must die. To have them certified as lunatics, he thought would be dangerous in the extreme. One lunatic was bad enough. 
But if you had four, five, six lunatics all crying out the same story, somebody was going to see a pattern somewhere. Right. And, and you know, there were plenty of very high-ranking, articulate politicians around who were, would have been eager to see that pattern and use it against the throne and the, the government in power. And Victoria knew nothing about this. Right. I mean, she, she wouldn't have condoned murder or, or silencing in any way at all. Sickert told his son, and his son told me, that the women were murdered according to Freemasonic ritual. That much of their ritual is based on murder. They are a secret society. On the whole, they are a society which does good, much good to charity, but they are a secret society of men who meet and perform rituals. Some of their basic rituals are the mime of mythical murders, some taken from the Bible, some taken from Egyptian myth. And these murders are the cutting, or, or let's take one example, the sign of the entered apprentice, the lowest rank of Freemasonry, is the cutting of the throat from left to right. All the ripper victims had their throats cut from left to right. At another degree, the mime for initiation is for the victims, heart and vitals to be taken out and thrown over the left shoulder. Stephen, why, why this particular mime? I mean, where does this begin, this, this whole story of... Why do they go through the mime of this? Well, simply to preserve the secrecy of their, their order. Um, a, a mason swears on pain of terribly violent death this kind of death? Yeah, all these various kinds of death, and, mm. and, and it varies from level to level, yeah. um, that he will retain the secrets of his order and never betray another mason. Mm. Um, when you've reached a certain level in masonry, you swear never to betray another mason, whatever he is engaged in, whether it be right or wrong. That covers murder, the lot. Stephen, back to the murders most foul, these, these poor women. Uh, they were slaughtered in such a way that one would imagine a torrent of blood would have gushed forth on the pavement, yet such very little blood was actually found, in ex well, except for Marie Kelly's case, uh, around the area of the crime. Yes, this is one of the enduring mysteries of the Ripper case. M no writer has been able to explain it. There was so little blood found at one of the murders, for instance, uh, Annie Chapman's, that uh, the doctor who attended suggested it would have filled one or two wine glasses at most. And yet she had had her head severed from her body almost. Uh, there was speculation at the time that the women couldn't have been murdered where they were found, but that they had been murdered elsewhere and then later deposited at these spots. Sickert told his son that the three of the women, at least, were in fact murdered in a moving carriage. The way in which these murders occurred, surely these women... I mean, it is such a nightmarish tale. They must have screamed, struggled, given some clues uh, as they were being mutilated. The uh, people nearby must have heard something going on. Not necessarily. According to Sickert, the women were fed black grapes poisoned with laudanum that's a tincture of opium oh. and that induced unconsciousness and death before any mutilations were carried out oh. so there would be no struggle no screams right uh, and would have it would have enabled all the surgery the barbaric surgery that took place on them to be carried out with relative ease and speed. After which the cab went on its way back to its owner's residence. It was obviously covered in gore and blood. It was washed out ready for its next grisly assignment. Very few mass murderers ever give up without giving a clue or two. And there were many letters supposedly written by the Ripper 
to Scotland Yard, but you say there's only one genuine Ripper letter. Yes, I do. Uh, there were hundreds, there are hundreds of letters purportedly sent by the Ripper still in the Scotland Yard file. And I've seen them and I've read them all. And many books are based their cases on any selection of these letters which the writer chooses to make, which that's any selection which fits his case. One book in particular is based entirely on these letters. And to believe that these letters are all genuine would be to believe that the Ripper spent all his time writing and that he had a vast knowledge of languages and went from to places as far away as Barcelona and Venezuela mm. to post his mad messages. It's all ludicrous. Uh, they were from hoaxes. All the letters but one. And that letter came accompanied by half a human kidney. Which, half a kidney? Half a kidney, which has been established as near as it's possible to establish anything that it was Catherine Eddowes kidney. The letter and the kidney was sent to Mr. George Lusk. He was chairman of the Whitechapel Vigil Vigilance Committee, set up to patrol the streets at night to protect citizens. I'll read you the letter. From hell. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. T'other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Jack the Ripper was not one man, but three. Are we looking at three actual rippers, three people who had knives and scalpels in their hands and did the cutting, or are we talking about one specialist and two accomplices? We're talking about two killers and one accomplice. Interesting. To what extent the one accomplice participated, I've not been able to discover. It's not possible ever to discover that. So let us talk about the one accomplice. I want to know who this is. I want to know about this man. Well, there were three men. There were no women involved in this. Oh, no. There were three men. Uh, before I name any names, why don't I take you to where the chief ripper is today? This is a bleak place, Stephen, here. Yes. Like, like a Bronte novel, isn't it? Oh, my word. Cold enough. But this is the graveyard of Thorpeless Soken in Essex. And here lies Jack the Ripper. This grave? That's it. William Withy Gull. That's him. The man in charge of the Ripper operation. And the man who committed four of the five murders. So the man out of everyone's bad dreams, the, the one you imagine had the cloak, the guy who held the scalpels and did all the frenzied cutting, this is the man. That's it? Yes. He was put in charge of it by Lord Salisbury. He'd already committed Annie Elizabeth Crook to an asylum. So he was, uh, as I say, he was already involved and they wanted somebody to silence the other women who successfully. He was a high-ranking Freemason, and then something strange happened. He was an incredibly bizarre man. He was of a, a very strange turn of mind. He decided that it would be just so dangerous to, to commit the other women that they had to be killed. And so that, that's how he went about it. He, he had them hunted down by his two accomplices, by his two accomplices, his two helpers, uh, and he killed them in a Masonic way. So a man of supremely high medical standing, the man who did the cutting, the Chief Ripper, lies there. Yes. Physician in ordinary to Queen Victoria. Jack the Ripper. Sickert said that the man who drove the handsome cab was John Netley. He was the man who had previously ferried Prince Eddie to and from 
tickets between ticket studio and the palace so he was already involved yes. uh, whether or not he was a mason is in doubt sicket didn't know but he certainly wanted to get in with powerful people and would do anything to be able to you know give himself a step up on the ladder right um, so he he was uh, recruited to to drive the the death carriage of William Gull and he also laid the um, bodies out in in the masonic way he also helped track down the women uh, he tracked down Mary Kelly said Sickert with the aid of a painting of her um, and the third man according to Sickert was none other than Sir Robert Anderson who was the deputy commissioner of the Metropolitan Police but uh, that turned into something different when I started investigating it it was uh, that was a very weird there's a twist coming up it, isn't that's it? right yes there is Walter Sickert told his son that the third man was none other than Sir Robert Anderson, Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. I looked into that allegation as I'd looked into everything that Sickert had said up to that point. Mm. And everything up to that point, of course, had proved absolutely true with solid ev evidence to back it up. But to my surprise at that stage, at that late stage in the inquiry, I found that there was no evidence at all to support the allegation that Sir Robert Anderson was directly involved in the murders themselves. Mm. He was certainly involved in the cover-up, but certainly in no way could I see that he was the third man. And then I, I realized that the evidence had been staring me in the face all along. The third man was Walter Sickert. He was forced into it virtually by Gull and Salisbury and all the rest of the Masons. Yes because he had been involved from the beginning, he knew Mary Kelly, he knew Annie Crook, and he could lead them to Mary Kelly. Who else had painted that picture which Netley had used to question people in the East End? And there is, in fact, extant a picture called Blackmail, which very closely uh, resembles a, a picture of Mary Kelly in the, in the newspapers of the day. Uh, Walter Sickert, in old age, came to think he was Jack the Ripper after a stroke. He used to roam the East End of London, dressed in clothes like the Ripper. My word, really? Yes, absolutely. He told his son that he painted the truth about the Ripper killings into his paintings. What, clue, painting by painting? That in certain of his paintings, there, exi there were clues as to the truth of the Ripper killings. Yes. Um... He painted, for instance, a series of murders called the Cam... a series of pictures called the Camden Town Murders, which he said were based on the Mary Kelly murder. There is a picture of himself, the artist in his studio, and in front of him in that picture is this, this bust. But it isn't really a bust. You can see it's a human torso and, and, and a piece of the intestine snakes from the abdomen over the, the shoulder. Over the shoulder, hey? One of the pictures, La Hollandaise, um, is it's a woman on a bed and it very closely resembles the picture of Mary Kelly after she'd been mutilated. It, it, the face looks like an animal's face. The man who did the cutting, the Chief Ripper, lies there. Yes. Physician in ordinary to Queen Victoria. Jack the Ripper. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. T'other piece I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Mr. Lusk, Mr. Lusk, Mr. Lusk.
A recent name to be added to the list of suspects, and this one I find really bizarre, is that of Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland, has now been named as Jack the Ripper.